the creation is coming, that will replace this creation, the new creation of Revelation 21 and 22. And what it tells us in Romans 8 of this creation is that the law of decay pervades the entirety of the creation, the second law of thermodynamics. And we notice in Genesis 1, that second law was in effect before Adam sinned, and it was in effect after he sinned. How do you draw that conclusion? It tells us in the text that stars were burning before God created Adam and Eve. Stars are extremely sensitive to even the tiniest changes in the laws of physics. Likewise, it tells us that we have creatures eating before Adam sinned. That's metabolism. Metabolism is another process that's extremely sensitive to even the tiniest changes in the laws of physics. In fact, this morning, that's where I drew some of my evidence for the supernatural design of the cosmic uh, features of the universe and the laws of physics. Uh, Metabolism and uh, stellar burning are are great places uh, to dig that out. Now, what we also notice in Romans 8 is that this law of decay remains in effect until the fullness of the adoption of the children of God. And in Revelation 20, we have the great white throne judgment where God finally and permanently conquers evil and removes evil from his creation. And then we're taken into this new creation and we're told about the new creation. There is no death there. There is no crying. There is no tears. There's no decay. We also discover there's no gravity and there's no electromagnetism. So the second law is no longer in effect. Now, what that tells me is that the primary purpose for God creating this universe was to provide a theater for the efficient, rapid conquest of the problem of evil. And once evil is conquered, this universe will have fulfilled its purpose and God replaces it with a brand new universe. Now, how does that answer the question about the goodness of the first creation? It's the perfect creation for the conquest of evil, but it's not the best creation. That's why I think the term you use there is good rather than best. The best creation is yet to come. In fact, Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 2.9, the new creation is so good, so wonderful, so perfect, no one can think or imagine how great and wonderful it will be. It's a new creation where sin no longer exists. Because sin no longer exists, we don't need gravity, and we don't need to be enslaved by space and time. To me, the most exciting part of the new creation is we'll finally be delivered from the slavery of living within a universe of length, width, height, and time. In the new creation, God's going to give us the capacity for simultaneous intimate relationships. That's impossible in this universe, and I'd argue it would be dangerous in this universe given the presence of evil. The fact that we're confined to a single dimension of time limits how much damage we can do to one another with our sin. For the new creation, sin will be gone, and therefore God can allow us to intimately relate simultaneously with millions of other believers. And so in that context, we realize that physical death of plants and animals as all part of God's plan to bring about a rapid, efficient conquest of evil. Now, if you want to hear more about it, uh, we have a six uh, audio tape series where we go into that whole question. Uh, A good chunk of that's in my book, uh, Beyond the Cosmos, although that book is not here at the conference. But you can get it for us uh, by going to reasons.org. And one thing you notice in Genesis 1, too, is that God made two different kinds of long-legged land mammals for the human species. I believe the correct way to interpret the sixth creation day is God is making three kinds of specialized land mammals to cohabit the planet with us and to serve us. And it says of the long-legged ones, there are two types, the easy to tame and the difficult to tame. The easy to tame, in my opinion, are the herbivores. And it's not my opinion. You can go to Job 39, which talks about those six-day land mammals that God creates. And, uh, you know, some of them are carnivores, some of them are herbivores. But one of the things we note is the herbivores are easy to tame. In fact, the way I interpret Genesis 39, you get a list of birds and mammals from the ones that are easiest to tame to those that are the most difficult to tame. 
The herbivores make excellent farm animals, but terrible household pets. Okay? The carnivores make terrible farm animals, but they make excellent household pets. And I think it was God's intent, even before sin existed, that we would have the full panoply of these birds and mammals because we get a level of enjoyment from the carnivores that we don't get from the herbivores, and vice versa, from the herbivores that we don't get from the carnivores. So in that sense, I would caution all Christians, don't call that evil what God calls good. As I read my Bible, uh, the death of plants and animals is something that is good. It's not something that's evil. It's the death of humans that is evil. Yes? A much more general question. I can imagine dialogues when I read something that you have with young earth creationists. I don't want to ask about that. But what about with Orthodox Jews and their dating of the, uh, the dating of Adam during the year 5700 or something like that? Well, uh, repeat the question, yes. Uh, He's asking me to respond to uh, what do we do about Orthodox Jews and the position they take on the date for humanity. Well, it's a converted Orthodox Jew that runs our Reasons to Believe organization in Africa, David Block. And uh, what he has told me that Orthodox Jews are a lot like Orthodox Christians. Uh, They're splintered. They have a whole different variety of creation theologies. So in Orthodox Judaism, you've got young earth creationists. You also have old earth creationists in Orthodox Judaism. You have framework hypothesis people in the Orthodox Jewish camp. So the discussion we're going to hear tomorrow, young earth, old earth, framework hypothesis, those same debates go on amongst Orthodox Jews. Do they interact with you, or do they just keep to themselves? Uh, no, they do interact with us. Uh, the question is, do these Orthodox Jews interact with us? Uh, yes, they do. In fact, they make up a significant fraction of our mailing list. Uh, a lot of Orthodox Jews even give us money uh, just because they like the fact that uh, we're doing research. They don't like the Jesus Christ part, but they like the rest of it. And so they're willing to financially support that. Yes? change of any rule before, you might have said that, I haven't heard it. And um, if the first man had not sinned, he would have lived forever. Uh, how would that have happened? Would God have had to intervene? Or was it his, uh, his original natural path not to die, and then God intervened to make him die when he sinned? Okay, the question... It's a question, question right. for the God. The question is, if Adam and Eve had not sinned, how would have God uh, allowed them to live uh, forever? Well, there are two positions amongst evangelicals in that, in that Adam and Eve may have been inherently eternal uh, before they had sinned, or there are theologians that make note of the fact that there was this tree in the garden, the tree of life, and that Adam and Eve were given permission to eat of that tree. And it tells us in the text that that... uh, tree uh, would have reversed the effects of the second law of thermodynamics. So that's the predominant interpretation amongst evangelicals, uh, that Adam and Eve would have been on the way to decay and death, uh, even if they hadn't have sinned, but they would have had access to the tree of life that could have reversed that process. Theologians taking that position uh, use that to conclude that Adam and Eve sinned quickly, Uh, rather than waiting several hundred hundred years before they sinned. Uh, Because if they had waited, say, even 300 years, they would have noticed some decay in their body and they would have run over to the tree of life. Uh, But evidently, they hadn't experienced uh, any visible decay before they had sinned. Uh, But there is an alternate position that they were inherently uh, capable, uh, free of sin, of uh, living forever. There's another view cross of Christ was in the purposes of God for all eternity. Yes. And that human sin enables God to reveal his everlasting love. Right. Which could not be revealed in a sinless world. Right. That would be true in any case, though. It'd be true in either case, right. Okay. Um, for clarity, the new creation of which you speak uh, in the Revelation 